Welcome to the first seminar of Hillary Term, which uh, we're very proud as the organizers of the Humane Philosophy Project to be running collaboratively with the Ian Ramsey Center um, for Science and Religion, um, and also with the Institute of Philosophy of the University of Warsaw, and hosted at Blackfriars Hall. Uh, and hosted at Blackfriars Hall. Um, we have, uh, as you know, four meetings this term, uh, and the first speaker is going to be introduced by my colleague, Ralph Weir. Thank you, Mikwai. Um, so, welcome, everyone. It's wonderful, once again, to see so many of you here. We're very excited to say that our speaker this evening is Stuart Sutherland, Lord Sutherland of Houndwood. Uh, Lord Sutherland is a distinguished philosopher of religion and public servant, uh, he's currently, I believe, a fellow at Birkbeck College, University of London. Uh, he served as Principal and Vice-Chancellor of the University of Edinburgh, Vice-Chancellor of the University of London, President of the Royal Society of Edinburgh, and Professor of History and Philosophy at King's College, London. Uh, he's author of numerous works in the philosophy of religion, including Atheism and the Rejection of God, Contemporary Philosophy and the Brothers Karamazov, Faith and Ambiguity, uh, and God, Jesus, and Belief, the Legacy of Theism. And on a more anecdotal note, for those of you who were here last time for our speaker, Sandy Stoddart, the sculptor, you might be interested to know that his well-known sculpture of David Hume on the Royal Mile in Edinburgh was unveiled, in fact, by Lord Sutherland, I believe, in 1997. Uh, and today he's going to speak to us on the topic of greed from Gordon Greco, to David Hume, so please give him a very warm welcome. Well, th thank you very much indeed. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you for having me here and, and introducing me in such a kind way. There are lots of things I'm sure you could have said about me that I would have once struck from the record of your uh, video at the back. And if um, they can eliminate questions they don't like, can I eliminate questions I don't <laughs> like from this? That's, that's got to be part of the deal. The um, theme is greed. And I think it fits with the aims of a group who are interested in humane philosophy. And you'll gather from the title that it has to do with aspects of our current society and at the same time, uh, the contribution that I believe David Hume uh, can make to our understanding of these issues and to the diagnosis of some of the problems we have in contemporary society. So it is an attempt to think more widely about a very practical, specific issue. Uh, and at the same time, try and remember I was once a philosopher and sort of pull bits out of my memory uh, and spread them around. I have to say one of the nicest memories I have is unveiling the statue of David Hume on the Royal Mile that Sandy Stoddard did. And there is, I discovered, there is actually a little plaque on the back that tells you that. But uh, the, the other part of the memory is it was a day like this. <laughs> and it was freezing and the snow was blowing through and the rain was blowing through. But there was something nicely Presbyterian and Calvinistic about it that, that uh, we all enjoyed before we repaired to the uh, town council and the Lord Provost providing a nice glass of wine. Right, now, greed. Uh, Gordon Gecko and David Hume. A number of you will, of course, recognize the name Gordon Gecko. I assume you all recognize the name David Hume. He was the character in the 1984 film Wall Street. There's I mean, a more recent and I think much trashier piece uh, uh, dealing with the same part of New York. This 1984 film uh, was focused on this character, Gordon Gecko. And I take the quote that struck me, um, and when it was uttered in the film, it just had a dramatic impact. Greed is good. And it was Michael Douglas playing, playing this man. So if, you, if you've got a, uh, a filmic imagination, you can see greed is good. And he was trying to persuade a lot of suckers to invest in various scams that, that he had. Now, that, it seemed to me, not least emphasized by the great financial crash that we have had, uh, 
is perhaps telling us something about how part of the world operates. I mean, if that really is a belief, and of course that's what the film's about. Alongside that, David Hume, and I quote, and this is from a treatise on human nature, published 1739-40, this avidity, this greed alone, is directly destructive of society. Greed is good, gecko. This greed is directly destructive. It's not just it's the kind of thing that we prefer not to talk about and we try and persuade good chaps and good gals not to do it. It is directly destructive of society. These are polarised views. Now, uh, somebody who was reviewing this little pamphlet that I, that I wrote about this um, said, well, actually, the big mistake in the pamphlet is that he thinks that um, uh, people still think greed is good. We all know greed is terrible. Actually, that's not true. He obviously meets different people from me. And I'll try and illustrate some of this uh, with, with uh, uh, quotes from the broadsheet newspapers. Greed is a running principle of how certain parts of our system operate. Now, we're all subject to the temptations of greed. I mean, if you're walking along uh, down there in the parks and you pick up a 20-pound note because it's lying on the ground, what do you do? You think, oh, boy. Or do you find some caretaker or policeman and hand it back in? Or you think, well, even if I do, what will happen to it? I say, I better just keep it myself. We all um, look, if we have any savings at all, for a reasonable rate of interest. You can't get it these days, of course. Uh, we all, if we have mortgages, try not to pay too much money to the building society um, so that it's all profit for them. Um, money intersects throughout our lives. And we all, have, uh, we all understand the tendency to make as good and reasonable a deal as you can. Now, just to be plain, because I, I, I'm now speaking to this, about this a little bit to folks who live and work in the city, I, I am not implying that everybody is greedy. I am not, I'm not preaching an anti-market view of life. I am not, uh, certainly not saying that um, there is a terrible thing called profit and it should never be acceptable in this current society. I'm not suggesting that all goods should be distributed 20 pence at a time across the population as if there were no differences. None of that am I saying. But when somebody like David Hume, on the one hand, says this avidity, this unconstrained greed is destructive of society, then I think it behoves us well to take note, to ask what grounds does he have for this and what is he saying uh, to us. Well, he's saying first that greed is not good, which is the gecko line. You might think that that's died out since the big financial crash, but no less a guru than Boris Johnson, speaking, reported in the London Evening Standard, and not refuted, was implying in a speech in the city, well, perhaps a little bit of greed's quite a good thing, actually. It keeps the economy ticking over. I wish he hadn't used the word greed. <laughs> but that obviously is still in the background, even of a public figure like that, the mind of a public figure like that. And more so, and I'll give you some examples, I think it's, it's, it's still a ruling uh, way of business in certain parts of our economic life. Now, there was a point not so long ago when for a sort of sane post-middle-aged man, I now have to say, uh, to stand up and talk about greed would be thought, he's either terribly left-wing or he's prissy. And uh, however, the word greed has come back into wider public use and circulation of late. I'll just give you some examples. In the um, Times editorial, 27th of October 2012, cupidity, it writes, is a human characteristic. 
cupidity is a, it's a universal character because they were actually commenting on a case in China. So this is not a couch, culture bound concept. It is a characteristic of how human beings think and work. Uh, Times Business Headline in February 2014. HSBC stars are to bypass bonus crackdown. And again, another example of an attempt to say that you shouldn't have huge bonuses, because we all get a bit fed up of that. I mean, I had some bloke um, earlier in the year, uh, no, early, late last year, uh, took home a paycheck of £27 million at the end of the year. Now, there's something a bit disturbing about that. Uh, there's been an attempt, and Europe will try and legislate on this, and our government and uh, Chancellor of the Exchequer encourage people not to do this, to crack down on bonuses and limit them. Uh, another uh, revelation in the Times uh, at the end of 2013, talking about a situation in Lloyds Bank, they took the title, Grand in Your Hand Bonuses Cost Lloyds Bank Dearly. And this was because they had set up an incentive system for those in the bank who were selling financial products, as they call them these days, uh, to old people. And they were clearly being driven by the profit being made rather than the needs of the customer or the needs of the, of the individual. Potentially, a high proportion of sales to potentially unsuitable customer. That's what was going on. Now, this is now being reported much more formally in what I regard as the, the, the quality press. I've got lots more examples of, of how at last we are occasionally allowed to talk about greed and its impact on how we do things. But does that take us far enough to agree with Hume? Because the fact that you can talk about... I mean, there is an embarrassment. I mentioned this in a speech in the House of Lords oh, about three years ago. And there was a bit of... <laughs> what's this chap talking about? Who is this? We thought he was quite sound. Uh, but clearly he uh, wanted to use the word... I was just raising a question about um, really about what Hume was saying. And I do try and teach some philosophy in the House of Lords without great success, I sometimes think, but, but there we are. But is it destructive of society? Because if Hume is right, this is not something that we can ride the wave on and hope it'll simmer down and the bonuses will only be 90% of what they used to be and that salesmen who um, cheat uh, people, uh, uh, old people into doing deals, there's a lot of it about. Uh, the, the salesmen who do this for absolutely reputable banks will not be disciplined for that. Are we expecting that to be the case? No, not if Hume is right. So this opposition between Hume and Gecko. Let's uh, just digress a little bit on Hume. Now, I know some of you will know more about Hume than is good for you and more than you ever wanted to know. But uh, can I just fill in for those who may not be um, quite as up to date on Hume? He was, of course, a skeptic in his own land. And he paid the price for it. Uh, my own old university... Uh, refused to make him a professor of philosophy. You know, the greatest philosopher in the English language, my view, and they refused to give him a chair. That, I warn you, academics, was because the town council controlled appointments. They were politically, politically controlled. And not just Edinburgh, I'm quick to say, Glasgow did the same. He was put up for a chair in Glasgow, and at least in Glasgow, they appointed somebody who was worthwhile. But in Edinburgh, they found a non-entity to fill the post. That's what he suffered from. Uh, and the Church of Scotland uh, tried to pass a motion to uh, really excommunicate him. Now, that wouldn't have made a lot of difference to how Hume spent his Sunday mornings, because he tended not to um, be a card-carrying <laughs> member of the church. But on the other hand, in those days... It was like being um, expelled from society. And all his good friends, and he had many who were moderate clergymen, would not uh, have been able to entertain him, at least not openly. And so, however, his friend rallied round and the church was defeated in its attempt to do this. That's how bad it was for Hume. Now, why? He was a skeptic, uh, 
and you all know he was sceptical about all sorts of things, uh, basically raised the question of personal identity. Is there such a thing as the self? He raised questions about are there causal relationships? My goodness me, um, science, where would it be without its causal relationships? He raised questions about that. He raised questions, of course, even more pointedly, about morality, and infamously for some, and actually using irony, he wrote in the, in the treatise, it is not contrary to reason to prefer the scratching of my little finger to the destruction of the whole world. What a, what a thing to say, not much wonder. The um, Daily Mail of the time got very upset about it. Is a man, not contrary to reason, he writes, uh, to prefer the scratching of my little finger uh, to, to the destruction of the whole world. And, of course, he made cracks about religion all the time. Wrote a famous essay called Of Superstition, which, of course, well, I don't need to go on. And he has this marvellous quotation that I love to use when philosophers are around. He says, whereas mistakes in religion are dangerous, those in philosophy are merely ridiculous. <laughs> um, but he was right. Just look around the world. Mistakes in religion are dangerous. Uh, but, of course, he paid the price. Now, some took the view then that this was a terrible man who was a cynic and a sceptic, and who was undermining everything in society uh, that, that was worthwhile. This is actually not the case. Illustrate, um, he wrote in a later work, The Inquiries, that uh, anyone who doubts the reality of moral distinctions is disingenuous. And he wrote also in the same book, The Inquiries, principle of morals, that uh, to be uninterested in ethics is not possible for a normal human being. We are all infinitely interested in ethics and in morality. So he was not discarding ethics. He was not throwing it out of the window. But what he was doing, and this was the nature of his scepticism, and he was a philosopher, don't forget, and this is what philosophers do. He was actually raising questions and doubting and raising doubts about the philosophical underpinning of various set pieces in the intellectual world of his time. And so when he argued that it is not irrational to uh, prefer, sorry, the destruction of the whole world to the scratching of a little finger, he wasn't actually saying we should prefer the destruction of the whole world. What he was saying is, this is not the conclusion of a syllogism. It's not a conclusion drawn from two neat premises. Put it up, bring it up to our own last century. <laughs> He's not implying that the problem with Stalin and Hitler was they hadn't been taught formal logic. That they'd made mistakes in rationalizing and reasoning about things. But he was saying, this is not an adequate foundation for moral distinctions. And his quarrel with religion, and don't forget some of his best friends were clerics. So it wasn't a social divide, and it wasn't a cultural divide, it wasn't an intellectual divide in that sense, but what he didn't want to uh, accept was that religion could provide an adequate basis for all moral distinctions. So he was, uh, he was attacking there are two of the great principles of the 18th century. One, that morality is, ba is based on rationality. Or secondly, that morality is based on a faith or religious foundation. And he even, although he's often spoken of as one of the school of Scots philosophers, they were called the common sense philosophers, he even denied that there was um, a sentiment that somehow, as long as you purified it and had it, as long as you felt good about the right things, you would get your moral division distinctions right. And he did argue, and again, I can give you the quotations and the text if you're uh, very interested afterwards. He did argue that there is no such thing as a pure sense of justice, that if we could only 
Uh, this relates to what's going on at the moment about moral education in schools. It's what you're trying to do to dump in young minds pure sense or sentiment of this, that, or the next value. Hume said, no, it's not like that. That uh, moral distinctions are not based in just what you feel about things. I remember... Um, chatting some friend, a postgraduate in Cambridge at the time, and we were discussing whether X or Y was a good thing, and it had to do with um, owning guns in the USA. Uh, and someone came up with a sort of variation on this and said, well, you know, provided it's for hunting purposes where you have uh, pests on the farm, or provided it's for this, provided for that. And what, what do you think, uh, Abe? And Abe said, mm, he said well... I think I'm comfortable with that. And the guy shot back immediately and rightly said, I'm not interested in what you're comfortable with. I want you to know if you think it's right. It's not to do with having the right sentiment at the right moment. Now Hume, as a skeptic, was saying these three ways, which were the ways in the 18th century, of grounding moral distinctions and justifying that you could draw moral distinctions, these three ways were not adequate accounts of the basis of morality. But he was not denying, certainly not denying, that uh, the moral distinctions we use uh, could have a solid basis, were essential for society, and I'll come back to that in a moment. He was certainly not denying that. So he was not a skeptic about morality. He was a skeptic about the fashionable theories about how you justify moral distinctions. Of course, this raised in his own time, and even more so now, okay, Hume, that's all very well. You're saying it's not religion, so I don't go to the priest or the church. It's not rationality, so I don't go to Bertram Russell. And it's not moral sentiment, so I don't find the most refined people on the third program on the BBC and ask them. That's what I don't do. But what's your positive account of the nature of moral distinctions and their place in our society. Now, this fascinating thing about Hume, so I'm coming back to greed, don't worry, because I think that's a test case for him. This fascinating thing about Hume, he was, of course, living in the shadow, as they all were, of Isaac Newton. And he had been um, bowled over in the way that other philosophers and thinkers were by what had been achieved by Newton. And so if you look at the treatise on human nature, his greatest philosophical work, its uh, subtitle is being an attempt to introduce the uh, natural sciences into moral subjects. And so what he was trying to do was provide a scientific basis, seeing how successful he, uh, Newton had been in introducing um, patterns of scientific thought and mathematical thinking, into our understanding of the physical world, he was raising the question, can we do it for society? Can we do it for human relationships? I, I can't think of a more modern question, but that was his question. And the uh, attempt, of course, was mirrored by various others at that time, I mean, just in his own city. Adam Ferguson, who wrote an essay on the history of civil society, one of the first attempts to understand the nature of civil society in quasi-scientific terms. Adam Smith, as we all know, took this kind of uh, understanding and penetration to economics and the economic relationships between um, human beings and between nations and spoke, wrote the great work, Wealth of the Nations. So that's what Hume wanted to do. He wasn't following the same route as them, but he was very close, particularly to Adam Smith. I mean, they really worked like that together. He was very close to Smith, but what he was drawing on was his massive second career as a great historian, where he looked at civil society, he looked at the history of society, and in so doing, began to understand, he thought, um, what the relationships between people and states and communities were. Right, that's, that's how he wanted to go about it. How did he get from that to the 
absolutely plain judgment that greed is destructive of society. Well, he got to it in, in, through a number of ways. In the end, all based on his attempt to be empirical in his thinking. The two main ways I would pick out that I think have lessons for us uh, in our contemporary world. One actually is, it was in his first go at it, was in book two of the treatise, if you know things sufficiently well to know what that's about. That was an attempt to look at sentiment, to look at what we would call the moral emotions, and to see whether an understanding of them could produce an adequate picture of where um, one could look, look for a foundation for, uh, an, foundation's my word, not his, foundation for moral distinctions. The other was in book three of the treatise where he had a first go at it, but this is something that Adam Smith also took up. He, he took up both themes. And this was an attempt to give an account of what we today, as philosophers, would call to look for the conditions of the existence and sustainability of civil society. Not to look for, as many at that time were doing, how do you tell a story about how society came to be? Well, there were first all these ignorant people who couldn't talk to each other, and then, blow me, they had a meeting, and out of it came the social contract. Uh, Hume rejected that completely. He said the conditions for drawing up a contract do not exist in the so-called state of nature. And the state of nature itself is a misleading term. So he wasn't going to look at the question of, suppose you have all these uh, folks uh, who have never actually dealt much with each other, could they produce society? I think it was a different question, and this is the one that's very relevant today, and to how we deal with what's going on in society. What are the conditions under which civil society can exist and flourish? That was the fundamental question he was asking. One had to do with uh, the emotions, and one had to do with book three of the treatise, and there's concerns there about the nature of justice and the definition of the rules of owning property, uh, in particular, and what equity means. Now, all these concepts were important, but there are two themes there. Hume is trying to base his account of how we can draw moral distinctions. Theme one had to do with the fact that uh, empirically he thought that we human beings were a pretty bad lot left to ourselves. I mean, you can see his Calvinistic background. <laughs> uh, he, he, he didn't believe in original sin and all that. But I tell you, I mean, we live in the borders just four miles from where Hume was brought up, and it's still there. It's still there, this, this view of human beings as no better than they should be. And um, he thought of human beings as not naturally going to produce the sort of society we'd all like to live in. So if that's the case, and that in the end we are, I mean, we use the terms today, we are self-centered, we are self-preoccupied, we are self-interested, and basically we're egotists. And I think, that's oh, a bit hard, a bit harsh. He took it right back. How many very small babies and children have you come across? Because, even if it's just in the tube, actually, their way of communicating with the world is demanding things. That's what it's like. Uh, they have no other means of doing so. If they um, need something or want something, they yell. Shakespeare got it right, puking and mauling, wasn't it? Puking and mewling, yeah, it's right. Well, we had three, and I've had five grandchildren, so a little bit of experience. But they, I don't think, I'm, I don't think mines were particularly uh, unfortunate in this respect. But that's how we all start. And we go through the stage that any parent will recognize that has the title, The Terrible Twos, because they have acquired ways of expressing themselves. <laughs> 
that are more than just a straight ball. I mean, they actually can target. Um, and they're very, you see, I see the parents nodding their heads. Uh, if you're at this stage, you'll know all about it. Basically, he thinks that's where we human beings start. And the task is to ask yourself, how do you get from there to actually quite a civilized class in school or quite a civilized way of dealing with major, major political issues? I mean, you may think it's a bit much, all this general election going on, but we're quite civilized in this country in the way we deal with some of these issues. We don't take the opposition out and shoot them. Um, we don't wield axes and chop them up. We do learn that there is a different way. Now, Hume said actually, and this is what he's dealing with in part in book two of the treatise, this is where we begin to understand the need to create uh, conditions for how civil society can operate. But this, the egotism of small children, I think he would see as a nice little model of the greed is good view. Because people like Gordon Gecko, people like Gordon Gecko, if they want something and they can get it, they have it. That's your average one-year-old. If they want something and they can get it, they have it. They demand it. They don't see that anyone else has a legitimate claim to it. Legitimate claim? What does that mean? I was joking the Times the other week of a chap talking to his accountant and saying, rapping the table, what do you mean some of my wealth will trickle down? <laughs> um, nothing doing. <laughs> the, 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 um, that was the picture Hume had of human beings. And the worry he had about greed and avidity is that it actually it, it's a regression, not to the values of childhood, but to the behavior of childhood. And the regression is this. If Gecko wants something, he can get it by theft, by cunning, by the use of power. And any one of those will do as long as it works. And that's by and large your average two-year-old. So... What, what do we do to contain this? The point being that if we don't, we will regress through the practice of this kind of unconstrained greed, because he saw the model for that being um, the very young child. Well, Hume had three ways that he doesn't go into this in sufficient detail, but Hume had three ways in which he thought we actually do attempt to tackle this and to change and to bring about the change in small children that actually civilizes them. That's the reality. Number one, very unfashionable today, is the family. He said, actually, young children, it's through their siblings and through dealing with parents, but in the family context, dealing with others and seeing that there are demands that have to be met. That it's not simply me, 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 but there has to be an accommodation on how one lives in even this embryonic community. You can imagine there's a great deal to be said about that. The challenge is, if you think the family's old-fashioned, and some think that's a very fashionable view to have, what do you propose as an alternative? to this part, essential part, in Hume's mind, of the civilizing process. There ain't an obvious one. I mean, maybe kibbutz is the answer, but, uh, and I don't know enough about them for that. Maybe, but I do know that my Jewish friend, who returned in mature years to live in Israel, they go to link up to family, not to replace it with that kind of society. Uh, just as a matter of fact. But the point there is that it's within this community first that the limitations of self-aggrandizement, self-demand, lack of self-restraint, puking and mauling, it's within this family that essentially it's first tackled. The second route is education. Education. 
Now, Hume had mixed views about education. He didn't think that education inevitably was perfect and good. And I have to say I agreed with him, with having been in that business all my life. Um, some education is bad. And there are ways of educating people. Uh, and I won't dwell or go into those, but you all know what, I, what I'm referring to. There are ways of educating people where you can actually create ideologues. You can create people with very negative, aggressive views of life to serve your purpose, all sorts of things. But Hume, in the end, took the view that formal education has a very important part to play here. And I just put it to you, and you may want to pick this up in discussion, that one of the great failures in our current schooling system, and I think there are a lot of good things about it, but one of the great failures is we have not come to terms with what I can only call education of the emotions. I mean, maybe in the margins it happens a bit. But I don't see how you could teach art or culture without educating the emotions. And I don't see how you can teach uh, what it is to be a citizen with British values, dare I say, um, without beginning to educate the emotions. And this is what Hume saw as part of formal education. And it, it's not just, today, I'm going to educate you about kindness. And you do it. It's how you teach history. It's how you teach literature. Today, I'm going to teach you about integrity. It's how you teach science. It's how you te teach political science. It's actually how you relate with the people in your classroom. Education of the emotions is a complex thing. But it takes place in all, and you know, you give your children up to the formal education system for 30-odd um, hours a week. And is this covered or not? Do they develop emotionally? Well, in a good educational system, they do, but I don't think we think enough about that in this country, and I just lay that with you, before you. And so Hume thought that in education formally, education of the emotions was a very important uh, element he also thought, and this is much more difficult, I'm trying to think about this in other ways, and Adam Smith did very significantly. He also thought that through participating in a common language, learning how to inhabit a common language is where you meet the other. Words have meanings that are shared, and unless that is clear, in how you operate within a language, uh, you do not understand what a language is and you're not actually inhabiting the language. Uh, you're using terms to make points that have nothing to do with uh, direct meaning. Uh, as I say, this is, a, this is a complicated one. It would take a lot of time in a side, side direction to go into it, but you might want to comment on this in discussion. So these three things, the family, formal education, and actually embodying a language, inhabiting a language. Now, that's different from learning another language. You can only do that if you've embodied or inhabited a language. Learning another language is a different and very important skill. But actually learning... At the moment, I'm engaged in an inquiry in the House of Lords, and we'll be publishing in about a month's time, into very early education. And it does seem to me one of the most important things, in this is talking about two-year-olds and three-year-olds, is ensuring that as they process through this, and it's now being made available to everyone in the community, as they process through this, that they learn to communicate. And communication is right at the heart of what inhabiting a language is. And it takes you out of yourself. And we were talking earlier, it's I and thou. It, it, it's actually realizing there is another uh, person with whom one is communicating. That person um, shares with you a language. And the more sophisticated your sharing is, I believe, the more depth in your communication. Now, if you think this is uh, a, a bit airy-fairy or a bit fluffy, as they say, um, a statistic. If you look at the in population of Britain's prisons, people who have taken themselves out of society, one way or another, 
over 50% are either enumerate or actually can't read, can't use the full resources of a language. I mean, that's a shocking statistic for those involved in education. But it's the reality. And what it does is it tells you that the process of communication is fundamental to being part of the wider civil society. And of course, if you end up in prison, that's exactly what you're not. You've taken yourself out of it. So all that is background to what Hume is talking about. Now, very specifically in relation to emotions, what he saw, the term sympathy, first gained real um, centre stage status in Hume's writing in the 18th century. It was taken up further by Adam Smith. The role of sympathy is that you see another person's point of view. Hume said, look, it's as a matter of fact, most of our judgments about other people are determined by our specific relations to them. And so we tend to be kinder about close relations, and then close friends, and then acquaintances, and then people of our tribe, or our community, or our nation. And it's a kind of eddying set of ripples. Uh, but our attitudes to other people, Hume argued, are determined by how close they are to us. The mechanism that changes this is sympathy. We might use the term empathy more these days. Now, sympathy tends to be what you look for at funerals. But, you know, empathy, uh, where you are understanding much more clearly the messages coming to you, but more importantly that they come from individuals who have the status that you have and therefore have any of the rights and responsibilities that you have. And so he built his moral philosophy around the concept of the development of sympathy, which is moral education writ large. And the mechanisms, um, family, language, school, are mechanisms. The aim is the much broader capacity to see as the great Scots poet says, and it's just past Burns Day, to see ourselves as others see us, or to see others as we see ourselves. That is part, that's what the sympathy stuff's about. So that's one strand of how Hume was proposing. Now, the problem with Gecko is he has no sympathy. He doesn't see other people as having legitimate claims. He sees them as mechanisms to be exploited, and if uh, his greed, greed is good, means that what he's uh, uh, advocating is that you grab what you can of what you want, that is exactly the opposite of the direction Hume is suggesting we must take if we are to create the conditions of the flourishing of civil society. It is regressive, it's destroying what, not just what is a, a nice addition to civil society, but it destroys the conditions for its continuation. And you can see it's beginning to happen, can't you? Um, I'll right, come back to that in a minute. The other strand that Hume took, along with sympathy and the emotional education, the other strand was uh, it's essential for the preservation of society that there is an absolutely clear understanding of the rules for having property. And it doesn't matter whether the property is a barrow or a bungalow, or whether it's a car or, or a coconut slice. It's essential in any civil society that folks understand the rules for actually having property. Property is not just something you have accumulated. It's something that is at the core of civil society insofar as we all ex accept what the rules are for who has what, who owns what. And this is at the core of Hume's political philosophy, the definition of property. That's why some speak of him as a Tory, I think in the 18th century sense. But property is at the heart of any civil society. And unless you go for a total ultra-Marxist view that uh, property is evil, which I can't see working myself, then you have to have very clear rules. Now, again, that's what Gecko denies. What I have, what I own, is to do with uh, my capacity to lie, to cheat, to uh, 
by use of power of various kinds or manipulation, get because I want it. Exactly the opposite of what Hume's saying about the essential core notion of property in civil society. The other one related to that is the notion of a clear view of justice. Again, there was nothing just in how Gecko cheated his uh, poor customers or colleagues or fellow, uh, fellow investment uh, bankers. There's nothing just in that. Now, this is a much, much more fluid concept. There are two, kind, two directions you can come at justice. One is it's defined by the law of the land. Up to a point is my reaction. Because occasionally, even the most moral, upright, and legally observing soul thinks that wasn't quite right, although that's what the judgment the court handed down. It's not unknown. But it is essential that you have it there so that there are, again, clear rules of justice about what you can do and what you can't do. But there is another area of the notion of justice that has to do with a concept of, say, equity. And both Adam Smith, remember, the progenitor of the market economy, hailed by even the Chicago School as one of their great forebears, Adam Smith, justice and equity are essential for the shape of society. And without them, you will not have a properly functioning or sustainable society. Now, the notion of equity, um, I think, is a is, is, is much softer notion in one sense, insofar as you can't necessarily write that. I mean, I suppose you could introduce a rule about bonuses that says... Uh, Everybody uh, must uh, give up a bonus that's got more than a 2% uh, margin on it. And I think the European court will try and do that. It won't be as draconian as that, but it will try and do something like that. Trouble is, the clever people who, <laughs> who get big bonuses work out ways to get around that. And so it's even laying down, although the law is useful, it's a guideline, it's a mark, it's, uh, it's helpful. But it doesn't settle the matter altogether. I mean, what is equity uh, between friends or within a family? A um, cousin of mine, apparently, um, whom none of us had seen for 40 years, has died. He's left a modest sum of money, and the question is, will it be divided equitably amongst all the cousins? I find this a very embarrassing discussion. I think some have greater needs than others. Would he have wanted the money to go this way anyway? He didn't leave a will. I mean, there are very family-related uh, concepts, uh, notions of, of what equity means in a context like this. And uh, not to mention prenups, what counts as equity there. Happily, I'm not of that generation. The, however, there are real issues about what counts as equity. I mean, when you, I give you the example of somebody who earned £27 million last year, now, is it equitable that perhaps lots of people living in his, uh, working for him, either directly or indirectly, are earning minuscule proportions of that and possibly live a very hard life? Is that equitable? Is it just in the softer sense? Now, Hume's not saying we can, we can define answers to all these questions. What he's saying is that by, by the way in which we help people mature, these questions will be discussed in a very different way. And it won't be settled by, how much can I get away with? I mean, I'm, I'm not against having an ISA, getting Tuppence worth of tax relief on it. I, 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 I'm not against um, lending money to my children without, or giving them without demanding um, huge, uh, huge uh, interest payments. I think all that kind of flexibility in society is probably uh, not just acceptable. I think it's a good thing, actually, because it then you know, persuades people that relationships are much softer. But if, if you insist you have a sharp answer to everything, you'll run into trouble, I have no doubt. So, education of the emotions, sympathy, moving away from the total self-absorption of the two-year-old, 
creating a society in which the notion of justice and an appropriateness plays a part. And I think what's shocked many people since the great uh, collapse is that there's a disproportionateness. And people say, yeah, 1% of the world own you know, 90% of the assets or whatever. And there is something disproportionate. I'm not saying it's an easy thing to solve, but on the other hand, it's a discussion that's got to be had as part of public civil life. That's the point I'm making. Lastly, how do you begin to do this? Well, actually, I think openness is one of the most important things. And what do I mean? Well, one version of it is, which can become pretty nasty, is naming and shaming. But another version of it, I propose this to some of my very wealthy friends with mixed reactions, usually a sucking of the teeth and a silence. Um, here's, an, uh, here's a suggestion for you that might change your society. Suppose, just suppose, the tax return of everyone was a public document. So we actually know, because if it was, you would know how much people give to charity. You would know how much money they earn as bonuses. You would know how much was inherited. Now, I'm not saying that we'd immediately produce a set of decisions, but I think that degree of openness would certainly provoke discussions about what was appropriate and what was equitable. And I'll just conclude by telling you, I'm reassured slightly that uh, one of my colleagues in the House of Lords, who used to be the chairman of the very influential finance committee in the Commons, John McFall, tough Glasgow man, uh, he's in the House of Lords now. And I gave him a copy of my little pamphlet on greed, just to see. I mean, a bit of wickedness, really, but just to see what it is. I was waiting for the sort of light the blue touch paper and retreat. But he's got so interested, he wants to republish it as a part of a group of papers and lectures by Justin Welby, for example, amongst others, by former directors of uh, big banks that have been given in the House of Lords on some of these issues. Because they have, they have got together a group. And it's in some ways a version of, of, of what, what you guys are doing. They've got together a group in which uh, they have taken the view that regulation is very important in the financial world. It's how the city operates. And the group's called the New City Agenda. And I was along at one of its meetings just on Tuesday night. Now, they, they have got this group together because they believe that the new city agenda is not something you can do just by toughening the regulator or just by pursuing tax avoiders. Of course, you should. Not just by making the laws sharper and tougher uh, for fraud, but actually by changing the culture. And if you don't change the culture, then things will continue to happen that we don't like. And actually, uh, this is, this again, is the reality. Since the great financial crash, we've had almost every two months another dreadful story about what some group within one of the big financial house, houses do. LIBOR, for example. Um, just an attempt to cheat the system, cheat their colleagues, uh, by fixing the, the uh, exchange rates or the interest rates or whatever, and international exchange. Many of these... Uh, the selling of products that are inappropriate for the person of the individuals to whom they're being sold. Very often not rich people, poor people, or moderately well-off people, but nonetheless. I, mean, I, I could give you a, a half a dozen examples. It still goes on. And why it still goes on is because there is still a bit in there that says, if I can get away with this, that's all right. And that is what Hume is warning us is destructive of society. And it needs a culture change to do something about that. Well, I think I've spoken long enough. Thank you very much. Very interesting and thought-provoking talk. Um, I will uh, chair the Q&A session.
Uh, and if you could wait for Nella to bring you the microphone uh, before you ask your question. This will not make you uh, uh, be heard louder, but we will get it recorded um, on video. Uh, and as a chair, if I could, before anybody raises uh, their hand, ask one question um, that I was wondering about. Um, in your book about... Uh, atheism and the brothers Karamazov, you make uh, a point about there being a need to fully represent the claims of atheism um, to be able uh, to fully understand the claims of theism uh, as uh, an opposition to them. So I want to, I want to um, well, ask a question unsurprisingly about greed and uh, its supposedly uh, constructive effects for society that could be argued for because you spoke a lot about um, the deconstructive or the destructive effects of greed for society. And uh, two philosophers that immediately come to mind is uh, um, a much later uh, Ayn Rand, who claims that uh, uh, greed is good for the society because those who accumulate wealth through greed um, then perhaps even without the intention to do so make it trickle down. Uh, and the second philosopher is, uh, of course, uh, uh, earlier Hegel, um, who sees, uh, well, something like the greed drive uh, not only as an accidental property of the relations between human beings, but something that lies at the very core of human nature. We become conscious beings at the moment of the clash of interest that we have over something that the two self-consciousnesses desire. Um, so I was, I was wondering how you would... Um, uh, you, you mentioned th that there might be a transition between this childlike state uh, of desiring something and a more enlightened society. Um, and you, um, you suggested two ways, one being of evolution and the other of revolution. Um, evolution being the education of, of uh, emotion and sentiment, the revolution being, well... If, if it would be at least a little revolution publicizing everybody's uh, uh, tax return. Um, could these be combined in any way? Um, the, the, you know, transition being made either by way of revolution of, or, or evolution. Do we need one or the other? Do we need both? Um, how, would, how would that work? Well, you've got two different sets of issues there, but on this last one, um, I, if, you, if you can think a revolutionary thought that would work, think it and discuss it with people, get it in the public arena. This was just my modest uh, an, an example of what I regarded. There's not, actually in Sweden, uh, tax uh, uh, returns are in due course in the public arena. And it doesn't have to be the same year you fill them in, it could be two years later, it could be 10 years later, but it would begin to tell a clear story. Um, and so although it, it, some countries wouldn't regard it as uh, revolutionary, um, clearly, we would in our country. I mean, it, it, you talk about this even less than you talk about sex. And I mean, you see how that's gone. Um, uh, talking about your money and your income. Oh, oh what, a, what a disgraceful thing to do. Uh, I, but I, I, I just put it forward because it, of course, tests why people are so uptight about it. Is, there, um, is it because, in the end, we'll, we, we, we will all cheat if we can? And um, if we're charging expenses, um, we will make sure that we've got a receipt that's most generous or whatever. I mean, there are all sorts of ways in which, in little dribs and drabs, it affects how people live. But um, I, I, I don't think it's a problem of how you combine these. If there are revolution, because what I'm trying to put forward is the need for a discussion that is part of civil society. This is part of what a civil society should be <coughs> and should do. But the, the um, idea that you know, greed maybe is okay because you do uh, accumulate money and trickle down. I don't see why accumulation of money has to be driven by egoism, self-centeredness, rather than by use of one's talents, for example. So I'm not, I'm not again accumulating. In fact, I think inevitable that it will happen. I mean, I don't think you'll get a society in which you could rule out the accumulation of money and possessions and so on. It's just you need to ask yourself every so often, in an event like the recent uh, financial crash, 
um, is, is one of those times. Is this the best way to do things? And can we achieve what's beneficial here? Because I mean, I, I do believe in trickle down. I've, se I've seen it in uh, rural communities. Somebody starts a business, and before you know where you are, there are people who have jobs, and they're not hugely paying, but that didn't have before. And of course, if people leave the local community, there will be no jobs. And if people leave the local community, it's very often because there's no opportunity to accumulate wealth and buy themselves a house or whatever it is. So I, I'm not against it. Quite the reverse. I think um, Hume and Adam Smith were right. The accumulation of wealth is, is, is very much part of um, how we organize society. And you can do it in other ways. You can give all the power to the king and the barons. But we got out of that at beginning in Magna Carta, I thought. But that was still possible. It's happening in other countries right now. <laughs> Don't tell me, yeah. So I, 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 you know, I'm not, I'm not against accumulating wealth, but it's the public discussion that sits alongside the development of a communal sense of what is equitable. I'll give you another example. The riots in Croydon in 2011, provoked by an unfortunate, terrible thing where... Um, there was a, a, an interface between the police and a member of the local community. Now, protest, I think, is very important. But is that, or was it in Croydon, all that different from the events of Black Friday, where people were raising, you saw it on your television screens, people knocking each other aside to get the cheap television set. So, I, I, I mean, there are different forms of greed, is the point I'm making. And the fact that you do get that kind of greed when you get a public riot, I mean, the operators move in, uh, doesn't mean to say that it's wrong to allow public protest, quite the reverse. But that's a discussion you have to have. It was very difficult to have that kind of discussion after what happened in Croydon, because people begin to lay down rules about what you can talk about and what you can't talk about. See, I could get quite controversial if you really push me. <laughs> 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 Any um, I might be taking um, the ideas you've already been um, talking about a little bit one step further by saying that... Um, I, I tend to think there's something that I would call a paradigm change and that people have actually seen through the capitalism, the uh, continuous greed, and that we won't really get back to a sort of equilibrium until society sort of makes that leap and changes to uh, new directions. Just Well, I, I, I suppose I'm maybe trying to pedal backwards from the idea of gecko that capitalism does imply unconstrained greed. Um, I don't think, I think capitalism is a mechanism. It's, it's maybe not the best way to organize, but it might be the least worst way, if you see what I mean. Um, and it is a way of having an established system whereby folks know what the rules are, uh, but also increasingly, I believe it's a kind of system <coughs> where increasingly we want to see that it's not being exploited as a system. Doesn't, doesn't mean to say the system should be thrown out altogether, which I suspect maybe you were hinting at. I, 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 no, I wouldn't, go as, I wouldn't go as far as that, because the attempt to supplant it with something else, Moscow at the moment, can produce even worse sales. And so you really need to know what it is you've got as an alternative, which is why I'm challenging Hume in my thinking. Now, if it's destructive, uh, what positively are you saying about um, how we can find another way of doing things? Um, thank you so much for your wonderful talk. Um, I was wondering if I could kind of uh, ask you to cast some of your conclusions in a kind of global sense. Um, and my question is inspired by a kind of interesting set of announcements that occurred just at the dawn of this new year. Um, one and a half weeks after Oxfam announced its projection that by 2016, 1% um, of the world's population will own 50% of its wealth, 
uh, the founders of Facebook announced uh, that their number of active users had surpassed the entire population of China. And this is sort of interesting because you know, Facebook is this incredibly diverse set of people and, and now the largest kind of political or national entity is trumped by the size of this community, this network. And it would, it would seem that there's, you know, a tremendous capacity for the inspiration of, of empathy or civil society on these sort of social networks. Um, and yet they, from my experience, seem to mythologize the avarice of the accidental billionaire. Um, you know, and they, they kind of um, reify existing social divisions. And so I wonder, do you think that this kind of technological interconnectivity, does this constitute a kind of shared language that might promote a sort of discussion uh, toward, toward a kind of human end, or what would you say? Well, I'd say two things about that. Uh, one is that the vast accumulation of wealth by some people, quite a few, quite a small number of people, um, in many cases has something to do with the fact that we have a system that can't cope with basically with uh, intellectual property. And if that's the case, um, we need to think about whether that's the best system to continue with. Uh, we have a system that um, allowed uh, the selling on of debt books without any check on what was, what, how viable the debts were as an asset. And so, I mean, these are very specific questions raised by very significant accumulation of wealth. And we have a system, and governments are struggling with this now, uh, which raises questions about companies that register offshore, Amazon, for example, and uh, all their profits, therefore, are taxed at a very low rate. The uh, trouble is, that involves other, c other countries who are making significant sums of money giving up uh, a golden uh, calf uh, that, that, that they have managed to, because of the system we have. And so I think these are systemic questions that are not easily resolvable, but it's important to get them out on the table as to what we can do about it. Same as, I mean, Europe might produce a set of rules about that, but it doesn't affect the Cayman Islands. It didn't affect Switzerland until recently, so actually I think Openness is what's affecting what's going on in Switzerland now. So that's, that's, that's one comment about that. Now about the net and whether or not this is, uh, it, it has huge potential, does marvellous things, but, but, a shared communication system where people can avoid declaring who they are is a very dangerous thing. Plato, the Republic, talks about Guy J's ring. And Guy J's ring would make you disappear. And that meant you could do all sorts of appalling, awful things and nobody would know it was you. I think we have a modern version of Guy J's ring in the way in which, including Facebook, some aspects of the net and the web are being used. And I, 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 no, I can hear all the arguments you know, if, if, if you make sure everybody has to be identified, how will you get protesters using the web in China, for example? Because they're quite good at um, dealing with people when they know who they are. Uh, so there are real issues here, but again, that, it seems to me, is the really big one about um, the web, the net, and discussions that take place in that way. If we could solve that, then I think your analogy is much closer because then it does look like a communication system where you're talking to somebody who metaphorically you can look in the eye and you actually know who they are and therefore what rules they are subject to because they may they either live in this country or they don't, in which case they're subject to the laws of the land here. But of course, one of the problems with internet crime is that it's, uh, you get a botnet going and you have 60 different sources and you bounce your messages all over the world and nobody can identify the source of the illegality. And I think that has to be... But that's like language. It can be misused terribly, just in its ordinary form. 
Um, always pleasant to meet another person from a civilized part of the world. You don't meet many of them south of the border. Um, <laughs> um, uh, I'm afraid not. Um, not that wealthy, I'm afraid. Um, I wonder with, with Hume as um, a key to greed, if Hume is really an ally or if not more of um, a hindrance, in fact, to not just discussing the problem but solving the problem. Of course, Hume will say greed is destructive to society. Well, we've got the letter, or the, the word is, but you don't get an ought from an is, as Hume will tell us. So it doesn't really matter that greed is destructive to society in a certain sense. And I think one of, one of the problems with Hume's moral project is, like Newton looking at particles, he looks at acts and wants to say, well, what is wrong with greed? What is wrong with greed? Well, there's nothing wrong with greed internally. I mean, greed isn't even a thing if it's not considered as a human act. And so really we need to um, maybe get to a language, a, a discussion about what human beings are, human nature. We all have this concept of human nature. We all have outrage at bankers getting bonuses. But why are we angry that they've got these bonuses? Why are we angry that they've got all this abundance? Are we angry because we've not got it? I mean, if, if we had an infinite amount of cakes and everyone could have as much cakes as they liked and everyone was eating all the cakes in the world, they wouldn't end up better people. It might be this, they would be sick and ill and it might be the same with Ferraris. <laughs> so, I mean, maybe the discussion has to go back to well, what are human beings? How should human beings behave? Maybe we need to become a bit more ancient in our thinking and with the clothes I'm wearing, it's not surprised I think that. But, um, uh, like, and this idea that human beings, rejecting Calvinism for a second, the idea that human beings are sort of fundamentally greedy because we point at a two-year-old and say he's greedy. I don't think the two-year-old necessarily is greedy. The two-year-old wants what it needs. It learns uh, through, through growing up um, that what it needs isn't what it thought it needed when it was a two-year-old. And so when we talk about what a human being is, fundamental human nature, we have to be more like Aristotle and Plato, I think, and not look at early stages of human life, but fulfilled human life. Looking at a two-year-old to learn what a human being is and the properties of a good human being is like looking at a pile of bricks and cement and saying that's what a house is. You know, it just doesn't make sense. Oh, well, that's the final judgment. Yes, <laughs> it doesn't make sense. Um, I mean, I think you've got a fair point about is and ought, but that's why I, I sort of tried to signpost in what I said, and I do in this little pamphlet, that I'm rephrasing the Humean question and I'm making it much more like the question that um, many 20th century philosophers um, asked, is not um, how do you uh, base morality on this, that, or the next thing, but rather what are the conditions for the flourishing of morality, which is not s trying to produce a ladder-like causal set of links, but it's saying in the absence of these, you will not have a civil society that functions or works. And I think a lot of what both Hume and Adam Smith say about justice is like that. And so um, if one consequence of that is you might say, well, actually an attempt to construct a civil society out of two-year-olds would be uh, worse than the Lord of the Flies. Um, now, you may or may not agree with him, but that's what human beings are like. Uh, but it, at least it's a discussable empirical judgment that's being made. And you might say, well, actually, I've got this saintly two-year-old down the road that's the pattern for the future. And provided we get the neurons right, they'll all be like that. Um, yeah, people do say crazy things like that and mean it. But I, there, is a, there is a factual question about human nature. I agree. That's an overlooked question in contemporary philosophy. Happily, not as overlooked as it was 50 years ago, uh, but it is an overlooked question, I agree. But that was Hume's question. He wasn't in that way different from the kind of question Aristotle was asking, uh, or even, well, Calvin is only, what is man? You know? And Hume was, was very much asking the question uh, about the understanding what human beings are like. And he thought there may be new methods kicking around that Newton had developed that he could use. So that's the best I can do at this time of night. Right, we've got time for one more question. I think we'll ask one. Unless, well, okay, two more, and Andrew, and then Ralph will be on. Just a brief observation of another source. Oh, mm. Thank you very much for a wonderful talk. Um, for particularly interested in the 
the way that ethics develops in relation to the other. And I was reminded of Dante and the avaricious in the circle of hell. And um, Dante asked to identify them, and they've lost their faces. And what a profound insight yeah. that they can't be. They don't recognize the other. They cannot be recognized themselves, and they've, they're eaten up with avarice. So yeah. there's an interesting inspiration there. Um, well, thank you. This is I'll, a question I might have to have remo- removed from the... <laughs> <laughs> no, I'll, I'll do the question first, then the refutation after. No, uh, it, it's actually, I just wanted to ask um, something about the idea of educating the emotions, which you brought up and you spoke about contemporary education, and I got the impression you, you expressed the feeling that education of the emotions doesn't happen today, or at least not to the degree that it ought to, that would be desirable. So it it seems to me, I'd be surprised at least, although I'd like to know what you think, So, if it were the case that there isn't the will to educate the emotions of children. I mean, I think teachers want the children that they teach to grow up to be compassionate and well-rounded human beings and so forth, at least in a broad way. So supposing the will is there, what is going wrong and and how would we correct the situation? (laughs) Well, in, in the 1940s, 50s, 60s, even in the 70s, I mean, there was John McMurray, for example, who wrote a book about reason and the emotions. Um, again, I'm not suggesting this is, the, this is the answer, but at least he was talking about it, and other philosophers were responding. In the development of what we now call the philosophy of education, around a group of uh, philosophers around Richard Peters and others, he spoke about this in some of his writings on the philosophy of education. And he wrote a book called Ethics and Education in which uh, the emotions come up. Uh, but also there were one or two others um, who actually wrote about educating the emotions. Um, what went wrong? Well, when did you last hear an educational policymaker or politician talking about the emotions in the classroom. STEM subjects, can't get enough of them. Teaching new languages, can't get enough of it. Teaching, creeping over citizenship. Well, I think what they will come to if they do pursue that line properly is that teaching citizenship is in part an education of the emotions. That's the that's the lesson from Hume and from Adam Smith. I keep pressing Adam Smith, because of course, when, when I speak about things like this uh, amongst people in the economics world, um, Hume's okay, but if you can quote Adam Smith in favour of what you say, wow, you know, he's got to listen to him now. Um, but but he, he, both of them stressed, uh, stressed this very strongly. But where is it talked about? Where in relation to, I mean, we all talk about the curriculum now, so that's going slightly out of fashion, but the curriculum didn't have a slot called emotions. And so it, it somehow people, again, don't talk about it very much. And if they're not talking about it, they're not thinking about it. And that's not a, a, a moral judgment I'm making. It's just that they will be doing other things. And uh, you can teach STEM subjects perfectly well, which I'm all in favor of, I have to say, because they're hard. And that's good. It's a good discipline. But you can teach uh, uh, STEM subjects without raising the question of, you can't, I think, if you're teaching literature properly, do that, uh, nor um, art or music. Uh, but, you know, I think Roger Scruton's book on uh, music and the emotions, um, there's not, uh, not many followed that up, have they? So the discussion is not taking place, and I'm, this is my little way of trying to provoke further thought and discussion. And I think if they do seriously pursue what's called citizenship education or British values, they will not be able to avoid dealing with the emotion I didn't mention, so I will now because we're going to finish, is um, I think there's a place for a rekindling of the importance of the concept of shame in our society. This concept is pretty dead. And uh, you know, you can be sorry for something, 
You can be sorry you might have offended somebody even if you didn't think you did anything wrong. You, you can be regretful. You can be this, that, and the next thing. Nobody ever says, gosh, I'm ashamed. But yet I'm sure in, in, in your darkest moments at two in the morning, just occasionally you say to yourself, God, I'm ashamed I did that or said that or was cruel in that way. Now, that concept, that's one of the points about the tax thing and publishing the tax returns. Because if you're not, if there's nothing to be ashamed about, what's the problem? But sometimes there is. And that's, and the bigger the bigger the bucks, the more there's likely to be. Why do you think people make a big noise now about how much they give to charity? To get away from that. I mean, oh, good, great that they give to charity. But there's an emotion I would like to see. And it's not just because I'm a gloomy Scot, I promise. <laughs> Lord Sutherland, thank you very much for an excellent talk, and thank you everyone uh, for coming tonight. Um, let me just invite you all to the uh, next seminar in two weeks' time, at which we're going to hear Professor Sofia Roshinska from the University of Warsaw, who's going to speak about fidelity in two contexts, friendship and our relation to God. Um, this evening we still have uh, about 30 minutes before we need to politely ask you uh, to make your way home, but in that time you're more than welcome to help yourself to some more refreshments, and let's thank our speaker tonight again very warmly. <laughs>